Lord, we thank you for our ability to be here today. We thank you for our freedom and our health. God, we just invite your Holy Spirit to have its way in this place today, Lord. We hear something from you. The goal is not to hear anything from me or hear anything from a team, but it is to hear from you and get closer to you. And it's in your name we pray all this. Amen. And amen. Wow, church, I'm excited to be up here today. Obviously, as you know, um, we, are, we did a series on love for the month of February. And we chose love because it was Valentine's Day and it was the month of love. There was no great revelation or rocket science behind why we chose love, but we chose love because that was the topic for the month. Can I get an amen? amen? So we've been talking about love, and Pastor Webb has done a couple of phenomenal messages. If you haven't taken the time to hear those yet, go on Facebook or get a CD, hear those, because he talked about things. Um, the first week he talked about um, Peter and some things that I had in mind, and then he covered it so well, so I had to change my message. And then the uh, other week he talked about Samson and Delilah, and um, these are messages on love that we need to hear as Christians. Amen? Amen? So this morning I have the opportunity to speak, and I'm speaking on love. It's our duty to love. Love is who we are as Christians. Can I get an amen? amen. I want to share a story with you that I found as I was looking things up and studying and preparing for my message today, I found a wonderful story, a true story, um, on a, a, a love story. And I want to read it to you real quick. As a college student in New Delhi, India, Pradyamna Mahanandi met a young lady from Sweden named Charlotte Shedvin, who was just doing some traveling at the time. And they quickly met each other, and they quickly fell in love. And they actually got married while they were together. However, Charlotte had to return home on her flight to Sweden. And Prad, the, the man, I'm short in his name, and Prad promised that he would save up his money and he would get to her to be with her in Sweden. After about a year of working and going to school and saving up his money, he realized after about a year that he was never going to get enough money to get a plane ticket to fly home. Like he was saving money, he, he realized, I'll never get enough to fly to Sweden. So he took all the money that he had saved up over in that year, and he bought a bicycle with it. And with his money, he bought that bicycle, and he set off from India to be with his bride in Sweden. He rode that bicycle for almost five months, over 4,000 miles, and across eight different countries to get to his bride in Sweden. There, they, they have remained married since then for 45 years, and when he was interviewed, when Prad was interviewed for his life, and the journey that it took to get back to his wife, his reply was, I did what I had to do to get back to her. I did it for love. It's that simple. Power of love. Power of love. I found that story very interesting. Very inspiring. Amen? He said, Sim simply enough, on all that bicycle riding, I did it for love. I did what I had to do to get back to her. True story. The power of love of love. But the simple fact is love is built to stand the test of time because love is more than more and beyond just an emotion. Can I get an amen? Because when we leave love as an emotion or as in a moment, it will quickly fade away. Because love, as we've seen in the video, is a verb. Love as Christ defined it is action. Love as Christ defined it is a choice. Amen? This is love. It is not just a moment because when you leave love to an emotion, or a moment, that emotion and that moment will quickly fade away. And when you left it at the emotion, your emotion will quickly fade away and you'll be left with nothing, a memory. But your choice, your choice to love, your lifestyle to love is built to stand the test of time beyond when the moment passes away, beyond when the emotion passes away. Your love is built to be a choice that would stand the test of time. Amen. This is the love that we talk about as Christians. This is the love that Christ exemplified to us with his lifestyle. Love. Amen. Love that is beyond the emotion. Love that our man that we just read about drove him to ride a bicycle for 5,000 miles. Anybody rode a bicycle that long? Not me. Because it was beyond the moment. Because if, if they're and, and I don't know these two people personally, but I would venture to say that if he was, if he was just interested in um, a sexual relationship with this woman, he probably wouldn't have rode his bike for months and miles to be with her after he married her. Amen? He made the choice to not only marry her, but then to make the trip to choose to be with her any way that was possible. Right? Love. The choice 
that he made. And as we talk about love today, we're going to take some words of Jesus Christ himself. And then we're going to look at John chapter 13, just verses 34 and 35. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Being what Jesus called us to be, who Jesus called us to be. This is Jesus's, just Jesus speaking himself in 34 and 35. Say, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Amen? He couldn't have made it any more clear than he did for us. Love each other. Amen? If you want people to know you're a Christian, love someone. Love them. If you, how do I live out my Christian lifestyle? Love. How do I let people know that I know Jesus? Love. How do I get other people to come to know Jesus? Love. Amen? As simple as Jesus could have put it, a new commandment I give to you, love someone. And then not only did he stop at love people, he said, as I have loved you. As I have loved you, that's how you need to love people. Amen? And I'll get into more of that on how Jesus loves us later. But he said, not only do you need to love people, do it as I have loved you. And like I said, I'll get into more of that in just a few minutes. And Pastor Webb, back in week one, uh, mentioned the word, the Greek word for love that Jesus used here, and, and actually it's the word that Jesus uses most of the time when he's talking about love. And that is the Greek word because the Greek language has five words for love, five different words for love. I don't know if, if you knew that, but there are five different words for love, and, and the reason they have five different ones is because they're unique in description. We have love, and, and I can love Dorito chips as my favorite snack, but I don't love those the same way that I love my family. It's a different type of love. Does that make sense? So the Greek language actually had five words for love. And the word that Jesus is using here, and the one he uses most often for us, is the word agape. I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it's the word agape, love. And this is the most common type of love that Jesus uses and describes and talks about. And it literally means, it literally translates to a selfless love. Love extended to all people a charity gift of love to all, one in the same. Holding, get this part, holding the capacity to care and love for everyone beyond just the ones that care and love for you. That is the definition of the word that Jesus used for us to love, that Jesus loved for us, beyond the capacity to just care and love for the ones who do that for you. Because anybody, as Jesus said in another passage, anybody can do that. Anybody, if you love me, I can love you. That's easy. But the test is when you don't love me, when you don't agree with me, can I still love you? That's the test that Jesus gives us. Love those people. It's not about do they love me. It's about Jesus loved you, so now you love them. Amen? And that's what Jesus asks us to do. A new commandment I give to you. Love one another. You will be known as mine on how well you love. So we love for Jesus because he loved us. Amen. We love beyond what people might deserve because we were loved beyond what we deserved. Amen. Jesus saw you at your worst and loved you anyways. And because of that, he asks you when you see people and you think they may not deserve this, love them anyways. Amen. Love people. Have the capacity. Have the love that Jesus describes to love them beyond what they might deserve in your eyes. Love them anyways. Care for them anyways. I want to point out something. Have you guys ever noticed that the people that God has brought through the worst things, the people that, that have stuck with God through the most difficult problems, through the most difficult things, the hardest trials of their lives, the people that have stuck with God through those things, they are often and many times the best people who represent Jesus here on earth. Amen? Because when something has been tested, you know it's quality, right? So those people who stuck with God and they've been through some of the most horrible things, whether it's losing loved ones, whether it's addiction, whether it's whatever, and they stick with God, many times they begin to reflect Jesus the best because they've been through it and they understand the love that carried them through will carry us through too. Amen? Because, and here's why that is, because when you understand that God did that for you, that is the very basis of Christianity, very base level of Jesus following, very base level of understanding your Christianity is understanding that God loved you, so now this is how you live. Very base level. If you get nothing about Christianity, love. 
If you get nothing else about following Jesus, understand that I follow Jesus because he saved me and he loved me and he forgave me. And if that's what he did for me and he asked me to do it for others, that's what I'm going to do. It's the very basis of how Jesus called me to live. Amen? The very basis. Understand God loved me because many times we, we get hate in our heart and we get anger in our heart. And, and I, was, I was recently doing a devotional with, with Emily and we go through this devotional and we, we had a really great conversation on the fact that if I can't forgive you, I probably don't understand how much I've been forgiven. If I can't love you, I probably don't understand how much I've been loved. Because I look at my life and I look at my heart and I look at my decisions and I look at my actions and I'm like, if Jesus can forgive me and call me back to him after the way I thought about some people, after the way I talked about some people, after the way I've done that, and I can understand that Jesus loves me, that means no matter what you've done, no matter what you've said, no matter how you've acted, I can love you and I can forgive you because I understand this. Amen? It's the very basis of who Jesus calls us to be. Understand what I've done for you and then do it for other people. Amen. I can't judge people. I can't do that because when I deserved it, Jesus didn't give it to me. So I can't give it to others. And this is why I want to talk for a moment about the, the importance of relationship and community in the body of Christ. Amen. Relationship and community, the basis of love. And the reason that's so important is because when you, when you have a great relationship with God, and you should personally, but you don't involve anybody else in your walk of faith, the enemy can more easily trick you into thinking you're alone. Amen? Because God is enough for us. God is enough for me. His love for me is enough to get me through. But if I don't indulge in that with other Christians, then when I go through something difficult, when I go through a hard time, and, and I'm struggling, and I've fallen in sin again, or whatever the case may be, the enemy can trick me into, you don't have anybody in your life to support you. You're alone. Even, even if God is reaching his hand for me and there for me, I'm still on this earth. I have no community. I have no relationship. And the enemy has tricked me into being isolated and alone. Amen? That's why it's so important to have relationship and have community and have other Christians that you can talk with and you can be with and you can be vulnerable with them and they can be vulnerable with you because the fact is none of us are perfect, right? None of us are perfect, and none of our friends are perfect, so if I can talk to you about what I struggle with, and I can talk to you about when I need help, and I can talk to, about, to you about when I failed, then when those things happen, I can go to you, and I can say, pray for me. I can say, be with me. I can say, I need help. Amen? But when we go through it alone, without community, and out relationship with other Christians, this is often what happens. We take it to God. And we say, God, I'm struggling here, so forgive me and help me to move on. And then, we, and then we don't tell anybody else about it because the enemy has tricked me into being ashamed. He said, don't tell, no, don't tell any of your peers because they'll judge you. Don't tell any of your peers because you should be above that. Don't tell any of your peers because you're better than that, right? And so then I haven't told anyone, and I just asked in my heart, I said, Lord, forgive me. And then I tried to move on for that. But then you fall back into it. You fall back into it, or you mess up again, or something really hard in your life that you didn't expect comes up again, and now the enemy tricks you into not only being ashamed of other people, but the enemy tricks you into thinking, you already took that to God and you messed up again? Oh, he's done with you now. You already asked for forgiveness and you messed up again? Oh, he's done with you now. And not only is God done with you, but you had no relationship, so you can't even talk to anybody else about it. You are truly and utterly alone. That's what the enemy wants you to think. Amen? But the importance of my community and my relationship is that after I pray to God about it and say, forgive me, help me, lead me, guide me, then I can go to you and I can say, listen, this is where it's been tough for me. This is where I'm struggling. This is where I'm hurting. Can you pray with me? Can you talk with me? Can you walk with me? Can you be with me? And the, the community will build. The relationship will build because we love each other. Love someone. Be vulnerable with someone because that's how Jesus loved you. Amen. The basis of my community and my relationship is being open because when I'm open with God, when I, was, when, I, when I had my interaction with God, he accepted me. And whenever we can do that with each other, build each other's relationship up in Christ, in faith, in spirit, then we have each other. We're no longer alone. When the enemy tries to trick you into thinking you're alone, you have a faith-based community that will pray with you and fight with you. Amen? So we're talking about loving people. Loving people can be hard sometimes, right? Loving someone can be hard. Liking someone can be difficult, amen? You know, we say, like, I'm a Christian, and I love people, and it's the easiest thing ever. I love everyone, 
It's, I've, I've never struggled with that ever. That's not true. If you're a Christian, you know that's not true. You see people, you judge people, and you have to ask for forgiveness. Amen? Loving people and liking people is not always the most easy task that God ever gave us, is it? Some people are difficult to love. Some people are difficult to like because people are different than us. Maybe someone hurt you. It's tough to love them. Maybe someone disrespects you. Maybe someone thinks differently than you. Maybe someone acts differently than you. Maybe someone believes differently than you. Maybe some people vote differently than you do. Maybe some people live their lives differently than you do. Or worst of all, maybe some people cheer for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Some people do these things. And we do these things and we're like, how, how, how could I love these people? Some people are called to love. Amen? All jokes aside, the sound team is all Steelers fans, so if my mic cuts out, you know why. Some people are difficult to love, right? All these things I said, you look at people and you're like, God, love these people? Love these people? It's, it's a little bit difficult. So how can we grow in that? It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to actually do it. Amen? So how do I love people? I want to read one more story um, of an encounter that someone had with Jesus, again, in John chapter 8. We're going to read this story in John chapter 8, verses 3 through 11. And the reason we're going to talk about this story is because of love. <laughs> no. The reason we're going to talk about this story is because it's, it's easier for you to love because we just talked about it being difficult to love some people. It's difficult to like some people. And so how do I do that? When I find it difficult to relate to someone, when I find it difficult to pray for them, how? How do I do it? And it's easier to do when you understand what Jesus did for you. And I know I talked about that briefly, but back in John 13, Jesus said, love people how I have loved you. So the best way for me to figure out how to do that is figure out how has Jesus loved me, right? If Jesus wants me to love people how he loved me, I need to figure out how he loved people. And the best way to see how he loved people is to see how he interacted with people. So we're going to read John chapter 8, verse 3 through 11 in just a moment. But I want to remind you, as we talk about what Jesus has done for you, I just want to highlight the crucifixion that Jesus went through just briefly. I'm not talking about the crucifixion as my main point, but just briefly, because many of you know the Roman crucifixion was not only the most brutal and devastating way to be put to death at that time, but it was also viewed and looked at as the most shameful way to be put to death. That was so shameful, in fact, that the Roman soldiers and the Roman government who would put people to death, oftentimes, very last resort, if they had to, wouldn't even crucify Roman citizens because it was so disgraceful and so shameful that they wouldn't even put their own citizens, their own criminals, through that because it was looked at as not only brutal and fatal and disgusting, but shameful, disgraceful. And Jesus gets put through this crucifixion up until the time of death, it's torturous. The beforehand, the actual hanging on the cross, and even up during hanging on the cross, and up until the time of death, it is utter and complete torture. Physical, spiritual, emotional, mental, it's torture. Jesus is hanging on a cross for you, and for me. And I wanted to point out, not only was it brutal, but he took on shame, and he took on regret, and he took on disgrace, and he took on all these things as he hung there, beaten on a cross for us. And what I want to highlight about that is this shame and death and torment was actually mine first. Amen? This shame that Jesus went through, it was actually designed for me. Because the enemy looked at imperfection and looked at shame and looked at disgrace and looked at guilt and looks at these things and he says to God, look at these people that you created. How could he be yours when he acts this way? How could he be yours when he does these things? How could he be yours? Somebody has to pay for all this pain and problem that your people have done. Amen? Because like, like I talked about a few weeks ago, justice had to be served for all the sin that was in the world. Justice has to be served. So the enemy looks at us and he says, somebody has to pay for all this sin. And God responds with Jesus. God responds with 
love. Because the enemy looked at you and said, somebody's got to pay for all your sin, imperfection, disgrace, guilt, shame. Somebody's got to pay for those, and it's going to be you. And God responds with love. God responds with Jesus. Don't take them, take Jesus. Don't take them, take Jesus. Don't look at their pain and their struggle and their problems. Don't kill them, take Jesus. Amen? So we talk about what Jesus did for us, and that's what he did in the crucifixion. And you'll understand why I highlighted the shame and the torment and the death here in just a minute as we read John 8, 3 through 11. John 8, chapter 3 says, The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in his midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commands us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against Jesus. Jesus bends down, and he writes with his finger on the ground. And as they continue to ask him, he stands up, and he says to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down, and he writes on the ground again. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And Jesus stands up and he says to the woman, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she says, No, no one, Lord. And Jesus says, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Jesus has this interaction where he literally saves this woman's life from death. Amen? He saved her. They were about to kill this woman for the sins she had committed. The woman is caught in adultery. They drag her there by force to subject her to not only death, but to shame and to be guilty of what she's done, to subject her to shame and guilt and ultimately to kill her. They drag her there, beat her, take her there by force. They, they press the issue onto Jesus as Jesus takes his time to answer writes in the sand, they press it. They don't want to let it go. They continue to accuse. They're like, Jesus, this is the situation. Give us an answer. What are we going to do with this person? This is what's happening. And Jesus lets her go so easily and so freely, gets her off the hook because he understands that he will soon take her place not only in death, but in shame and in guilt as well, just like he took ours and he took mine and he took yours. Amen? And Jesus lets this woman go, and he turns the table on the accusers, and he says, whichever one of you is perfect, go ahead and kill her. Amen? He turns the table on this because this woman is brought in so much shame because let's not forget she was caught in adultery, right? So she was probably drugged there in pain because they beat her and drug her there, and she was probably next to naked, wrapped in maybe a sheet. So much shame and so much guilt that I cannot really understand what she was going through in this moment. Amen? And they bring her to Jesus, and they're like, Jesus, look at this disgrace of a woman. We're supposed to kill her. And Jesus takes her side and says, well, whoever's perfect, go ahead and do it. And he takes her shame, and he takes her guilt, and ultimately, he takes her death upon himself. Amen? And this is what Jesus does for the woman. Jesus simply says to the woman, you were caught in this action. You were caught up in this moment. This is what you deserve. You had death coming for you. You lived in it, and now it was time for you to pay the penalty, right? And they brought you here to me for you to die. But you needed new life. You needed new health. You needed new spirit. You needed new water. You needed a restart, and here I am. You needed these things. You needed to come home. You needed love. You needed peace. You needed forgiveness. And they brought you here to me. You needed not only life physically, but you needed it spiritually. And they brought you here to me. And when they thought they were going to kill you, you were begging for life. And here I am. Amen. Jesus says to this woman, you desperately, desperately, desperately needed to come home to find forgiveness, to find love, to find peace in your spirit. And here I am. Here I am. This is what you needed. You need life. Here I am. And it's the same invitation that Jesus offers to us. You need life. You need forgiveness. You need home. You need peace. You need whatever you need. Here I am. It's the same invitation that Jesus gave to her as he gives to us. Amen? 
And I want us to notice something about people who come into contact with God, people who have a relationship with Jesus, people who understand the love that God has for them. Whether you've done this already and you've encountered God or you haven't done it yet, I want us to understand something. Every time somebody comes into this relationship with God, it is almost always described as a homecoming. I felt home. I felt at peace. I felt at home. Now, a homecoming is when you have a home, you have people that love you, you have a place that you belong, and you're taken away from that place, or you go away from that place, and then the, the, the new life, the refreshness of coming home again, back into the place where you truly belong. That's a homecoming, correct? When you're away, and then you're brought back to where you truly belong. It's the peace. It's being at home with where you belong. So the, the thing that crossed my mind was how do people who have never given God a chance, how do people who have never loved God, how do people who have never had this interaction, when they enter God, why is it always I felt at home? You don't even know where home was. What does that tell me about my creator? That tells me that he's the one who created me, created my soul, and if I need peace, I can go to him. Even if you've never had it before, you take it to Jesus, you feel at home, you feel forgiven, you feel loved. Can I get an amen? This is where I belong. It's, this is, my soul longed for something, and I tried to fill it with drugs, or I tried to fill it with alcohol, I tried to fill it with sex, I tried to fill it with music, I tried to fill it with whatever I tried to fill it with, I tried to fill it with friends, but there was still something in me that this isn't where my soul belongs. But then I stepped into an encounter with Jesus Christ, and I immediately felt like I was home, my soul was home, the peace and the love of God was where I always needed to be. Amen? This is where I needed to be, and this is where I am. This is home. It's where I belong. Relationship with God is where I belong. Now back to the woman caught in adultery. Before I close, I just have a couple more things to say. The woman caught in adultery that we just read about. Many times we kind of use the, the biblical stories that we're supposed to learn from, and we, we elevate them to fairy tale level, and this is what I mean. We look at the story and we're like, yes, Jesus saved her, and that's great, and the woman just needed someone to love her, and the woman just needed someone to care for her, and the woman just needed Jesus, and we know that, and that stuff's all true, except let's not forget that the woman was guilty. She was guilty. Everything we read in John 8 about this woman was true. She was an adulteress. She was supposed to be put to death. She did get caught. The law did say, kill this woman. She wasn't pleading innocent. She was guilty, okay? The woman was caught, and she was guilty. Guilty. She, everything, everything that the law said against her was absolutely true. And for some reason, Jesus stood on her side. Did we read that right? The woman was guilty. The law said, stand against this woman, and Jesus writes in the sand. It's, we're not told what he writes in the sand. Some scholars believe it just was a line. Others believe it was the woman's name. Others believe it was the Pharisee's name. I believe if it was important that we knew what was wrote, we would have been told. But Jesus writes in the sand, whether it's for argument's sake, a line, and he stands on the side of the guilty. Did we, did we read this story right? The woman was condemned. She should have been murdered. And Jesus writes in the sand, and he stands on her side against the accuser. Oftentimes, we want to stand on the wrong side, and here's what I mean by that. We want to pardon our own sin and cast judgment on others. My sins are okay. My sins aren't that bad. My sins are dignified. My sins are respectable. If I want to be imperfect, that's okay. But you... How, could, how dare you act that way? How dare you live that lifestyle? How dare you talk that way? How dare you? Jesus should judge you and condemn you. But my sins are, they're okay. They're not the worst. I've never killed anyone, so for the most part, I'm okay, right? My sins are good. I pardon my sins. But these people over here, there's no pardon for them. They need to be killed, right? We look at the guilty. We're like, they're guilty, Guilty. How often does Jesus draw the line in the sand and stand on the side with the guilty and we're on the wrong side? Too often. Excuse me. 
Too often, too often, Jesus stands with the guilty, and I'm the accuser. Amen? Too often. And because the guilty ones are the ones they know they need Jesus, and they know they have to have relationship with Jesus, because if I can't accept the fact that I'm imperfect, then I'm too good for Jesus anyway. Jesus doesn't need to save me from anything because I'm okay. But the guilty ones say, I'm so imperfect, and I'm so wrong, and I'm so condemned that without Jesus, I'm nothing. Amen? And those are the ones that have the encounters with Him because they understand that they're the guilty and they're the accused, and without Jesus, their life is nothing. And if you want to come into relationship with Him, you have to understand that without Jesus, you're one in the same as the condemned. I can't, ju- I can't judge and hate people because without Jesus Christ in control of my life, where they are, that's where I would be. Far from God. Amen? I could trade in everything I have, but without Jesus, it's nothing. Jesus opens up His arms and He welcomes us home and all we have to do is accept it, church. Amen? So the answer is, how can I love people? How can I love people? How can I do that? And the answer is, look at Jesus. Look at how Jesus loved you. Because the simple fact of the matter is, the story of the woman that we just read, when he stood with the guilty and literally saved her life and went on to take on her death and her shame and her guilt, take out the woman and put yourself. Because the reality is, that's exactly where we were. The enemy looked at us. The enemy looked at you and he said, you have sinned against God. Your soul is mine. And Jesus drew the line in the sand and stood with you and said, they're mine. You can't have them. So when you understand that, it becomes easy for you to love people. When I understand that Jesus drew the line and stood with me, it's easier for me to draw the line and stand with people and love people. Can I get an amen, church? And all I have to do is turn from my sin. Go and sin no more. Turn away from my sin. Understand that I'm guilty. And Jesus stands there ready to welcome me home. Just like he welcomes you home and just like he welcomes anybody else who's willing to come to him and turn from their sin home. Can I get an amen? Amen. And I'm closing if Pastor Webb wants to come to the piano. Because the simple fact of the matter is if you got nothing else from this message, the whole point is It's all because of love. Everything God did for you and everything God caused you to be. Love. Love. This is who we are. God called me to be something. What is it? Love. And to quote our friend Prad, whose love story we read at the very, very beginning of the message, to quote him, I do it for love. It's that simple. Amen? Jesus said, love people how I have loved you. How has Jesus loved me? When I was guilty, he loved me. When I needed saving, he loved me. When people are hurting, love them. Understand what Jesus did for you. And when you do, it's so much easier to not cast the stone. It's so much easier to love and accept and be okay with people. Because Jesus himself said, a commandment I give to you, love. Not just love the people who love you, but love everyone how I have loved you. Amen, church. Stand with me as we pray. God, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for your simple message of love. God, I pray right now that if anybody doesn't understand your love for them, that you would open up their eyes and you would have an encounter with them. And Lord, I move on to pray for us individually that we would exemplify your love so well that people would see Jesus in it. Exemplify your love so well that people would come to know who you are and come to know your love because we did what you asked, and that's love people. God, I pray that over each and every one of us today. In your name I pray, amen.